Our scripture for today comes out of John chapter 3. We'll be reading from verses 1 through 21 from the New Revised Standard Version. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe... How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. We give thanks Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, help us to come into your light. Uh, reveal where we are in line with you and, Lord, where we are not. By your word proclaimed by Pastor Nikki, convinc- convict our hearts. Teach us the way to go as we hear your word. And, Father, we pray that you would just fill Pastor Nikki with your spirit that her words might be an expression of your truths and that we would receive them. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. I'm going to make a bold claim, everyone. Get ready. You ready? All right. There's exactly one way that I'm like my mother. I, I can dispute all others to varying degrees of success except for this one way, and you, you're never going to guess it unless someone from first service told you matching holiday pajamas. <laughs> we had to do it. Uh, she insisted that her children match at least once a year, and the easiest time for that to happen was Christmas time. Uh, but one time, it wasn't only pajamas. I think my mom got like a little feisty that year. And I regret to inform you, I could not find the photograph. Like I had evidence, but I can describe it to you. Uh, so it's my older brother, my older sister, and myself, and we are rocking matching windbreakers. Remember when those were cool? Yeah. Um, And so, you know what's cooler 
than having matching windbreakers that are white, black, and pine green. <laughs> it's also having a bowl cut, which I did. <laughs> yeah, it was very stylish. Um, but yeah, matching pajamas, that was really my mom's bread and butter. That's, that's where she was. And I don't remember hating it or being annoyed by it. I don't remember it feeling like oppressive, like she was taking away our individuality or anything. Um, I just remember the joy in her eyes. I remember the joy it brought to her face because there is nothing she loves more in this world than her children. And those pajamas were like this outward ordinary symbol of how cherished and precious we were to her. And that no matter how chaotic the world was or how crazy and messy our lives were, she was going to make this happen, not for herself, but because she loved us, because she wanted to show us how much she loved us. And without realizing it until I had my own little tyrants to dress at bedtime, I didn't realize my mom had instilled this love of matching as a symbol and an act of love for my own children. And I hope one day they can look back and they see the joy in my face just because they are, not because of the pajamas, but just because they are. Depending on our own personal relationships with our earthly parents or our, our guardians, imagining God in this way can be challenging. God is our father, God is our mother, our creator, our caretaker, caregiver. And if there's one thing I believe to my absolute core, it is that God loves us more than anything more than anything. And that love is all-consuming, it is unconditional, it is free, and it is never-ending. God as our parent also came in the flesh to be with us, to be one of us. Christ, Christ our brother, our friend, our teacher, and also the one who died for us. So in our conversation about sin, we have to talk about salvation and atonement. We have to talk about what we are being saved from and what we are being saved for. Some of the ways the church has answered and talked about this in the past through, or throughout the ages, while they're contextually understandable, they don't add up fully. They aren't consistent with a God who is one of love and a God who made us and calls us to be people of love. They aren't totally consistent with a God who sent his son to be one of us so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. And I know Pastor Rob promised you all this week that this would be a light sermon. So I'm, I'm hoping that this is true. <laughs> but I do, and I think in, in ways it is, but I also, I hope we are stretched. I hope it stretches us. Um, if I could show you all my homework and hair pulling over this sermon, I would, um, to get to that faithful witness. But suffice it to say, I was reminded again that God's spirit is ever moving. And we are always seemingly playing catch up, maybe not in a bad way. You know, no matter how prepared we are, it seems like God is always a step ahead. And I think that's a good thing. But I was also reminded of how God is present and growing and is grown right here among us right now. These are hard things we are talking about. And this is also a hard world that we live in. You could argue that it's always been that way, I think. So good people of the gospel, hear me when I say leaning into these hard things is a faithful witness. These little steps that we take every time we notice the discomfort and try to lean in and, and stretch ourselves a little bit more together to make room for God is a faithful and good thing. And Nicodemus was trying to do that. He was trying to make room for God as he comes in the night to talk to Jesus. And we may have heard or, or read about this before that he comes in the night to stay undercover because he doesn't want anyone to know that he's going to talk to Jesus um, for fear of being ousted from the community, for being cut off from the synagogue, for commiserating with Jesus. But you know what else happened at night when like normal people are sleeping or watching Netflix? The rabbis studied, they read, they read their books, they got into the law, done with the day's work and people's needs. They looked into the law to glean, to grow, and perhaps Nicodemus was doing just this, and he had a question, a thing that was beginning to form that he needed an answer to. Has anybody else ever been there? 
like a question that won't stop. Okay, for anyone who said no, you've never tucked in a four-year-old, <laughs> ever, because they have big questions and they have to be dealt with right then, right then. Last service, um, when Allie asked the kids if they had big questions, Lucy said, no, that is a lie. <laughs> I can't confirm. So Nicodemus is there because something is scratching at him and he can't quite articulate it. And Jesus sees this, yet Jesus seems to add more confusion. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus's frame of reference cannot hold what Jesus is describing or explaining or stating, which I want to offer this morning is not just a declaration about atonement and salvation, or in other words, it's not just about what Jesus does for us and how we can all make it to heaven. But it's also about who Jesus is, why he chooses to give his life for us, and what we are able to do and have right now because of him. So the highlight of this whole passage isn't just for God so loved the world. Rather, I think it's also, but those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. And let me tell you why. Pastor Rob defined for us sin as anything that puts an unhealthy distance between us and God, ourselves, others, the created world. So that definition is rooted in values that we learn from scripture, that we learn from the living word of God that's made evident through Jesus, through the stories that inform the people and tradition of our faith, the church. Those values are love, hope, faithfulness, belonging, healing. I guess if we were going to sum it up, we could say essentially they are values that support abundant life, which Jesus came to give, to show. So if we have a value-based understanding of sin to work from now, I think we also need a value-based understanding of atonement and salvation that, is, that comes from the understanding of abundant life. So in this passage, we experience Jesus trying to help expand Nicodemus' understanding, to shift his frame of reference about what sin is, about what it is God has done and will do to eliminate sin and its presence, its power, its being from the world and from our lives forever. And if we only pull out John 3.16, that God gave the only son that we would have eternal life, this can lead and has led to some theories uh, about atonement that don't quite hold it all together. And some of us may not know what atonement is, so let's define that really quickly. It's the reconciliation between God and humanity through Jesus Christ. So in, in non-Christian speak, it's the restoring, the repairing of a wrong or an injury. If, if we're on this side and God's on the other, Jesus comes to the middle and closes that space for us. That unhealthy distance that's caused by sin, this is the gap that Christ closes by offering himself on the cross. And now theories of atonement then are just what we think happened. They're, they're just that. They're ideas. They're um, hypothesis, hypotheses, whatever that word is. None of us will ever fully understand God and how God does what it is God does or entirely what God is doing, right? We have limited capacity, at least I do, I know. And to try and understand the divine, it's, it's our attempt to have faith that seeks understanding, to grow closer to the God who loves us. Now, the most prevalent atonement theory we may have heard or be familiar with um, is one, it's, I, I think a lot of people default to it, it's penal substitutionary atonement. Bet you didn't think you were going to hear that before noon. Yeah. But <laughs> substitutionary atonement. <laughs> or you may have also heard it referred to as the satisfaction theory. This teaches that we are all guilty. We're all dead in sin. We have a debt owed to God because of our sin that we can't pay. And so Jesus comes in. He steps in for us, taking our place, satisfying that, that debt owed, the wrath of God because of sin, and paying it for us. At times, if you pay attention to our hymns and other music, you may hear this lifted up in either like a whole phrase or just one of the, the words, like ransom. 
when this theory emerged and gained popularity, uh, the Northern European, European world was deep in a system of lords and serfs. So if you owed debt, you were in deep trouble. So in this setting, people could understand the great mercy of God at work when Jesus on the cross was described in this way. They could understand him being the substitute as paying the debt owed for us because they lived in the real reality of fear and threat and pressure of everything being taken away from them if they couldn't pay. And we don't exactly live in that place anymore. Are we still indebted? Sure, absolutely. Like in, in tangible ways to debt and other, other systems, but we are also entangled in this web of corporate and communal sin, as Pastor Rob explained last week. Much has changed, though, in the world, how we, how we view things and how we have grown and shifted just as our understanding of God has. So substitutionary atonement makes sense with a definition of sin that is all about do's and don'ts. It makes sense when sin is this thing that keeps us out of heaven and away from eternal life. It, it makes sense when sin is about fear and death. Because if that's all that this is about, is just eradicating sin from our lives, from the world, so we can have this thing, then we will sacrifice anything and anyone, even the Son of God, to get that. But with a value-based definition of sin and atonement, we make room for life, which is what Christ came to restore us to, not just eternally, but now. It's what God has intended, life always Life is a gift that God always intended us to have. So John Wesley, though not, not perfect, he's our, our denomination's founder. It's who we owe our theological home to. And he brought together the two great traditions of the church, the West and the East, together for this holistic view of what we are being saved from in sin, what, how we are saved by Christ, and what we are saved for with salvation. So a Wesleyan theory of atonement then is that what Jesus does on the cross is save us immediately from the penalty of sin or, or that debt, what is owed. And that happens immediately. That's the Western tradition and kind of where substitutionary atonement starts and stops. But Wesley also includes the Eastern tradition of the church, which is focused on healing and restoration. So on the cross then, Jesus begins that journey for all creation of being restored to the divine image of God that is in each and every one of us, that we share with everything. Progressively then, by grace, we are healed from the plague and the presence of sin in our lives and our world as we grow in love towards ourselves, towards others, as we act justly for our communities, for one another. And this is how God restores that image in us. Ultimately, then, and eternally, we are saved from the very presence of sin forever when we enjoy heaven together and with God. But before all that, because that's a lot, but before all that, here in the middle, in this glorious middle, is the gift that is right now. That is this life, which has much goodness and love and joy to live for, justice to give and fight for. This is why I offered to you that the highlight of John's passage may not just be verse 16, but also 21. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. We have all already been saved by Jesus. And when we believe that, believing in Jesus allows us to see it allows us to do what is true, to understand that we have always been gods, that we are saved to do deeds of goodness in the love of God. Because of who Jesus is, fully God and fully man, and what Jesus has done for the world, we can think from above. We can, we can be born again and share the mind of Christ. This is why this stuff matters as difficult as it may be, this is why we have to talk about sin well and understand well because it's connected to how we understand everything else. What we think about sin, atonement, salvation, all of that informs our faith and informs our living 
right here and now and how we share the good news in which we put our hope. It informs how we are the body of Christ for the world that was born of God's great love. And I think we can all agree that at times the church has gotten it wrong. We've gotten it right, for sure. We've gotten it wrong and we can make it right again. Those who love the dark or hate the light cling to what is broken instead of letting the light reveal it and heal it. So like Nicodemus is given a chance to begin to shift, to stretch his understanding to fit with the movement of God, we can begin to let loose of those things we hold that are broken, that don't fit maybe, so that it can come to the light, to let the light reveal it and heal it. There was nothing that was going to stop my mom from getting those pajamas. Like some years she even put them on layaway so she could make little payments so we would have them in time. And I know it's silly, it's super silly, um, but I am healed through watching my kids wear matching pajamas. And it really has nothing to do with the pajamas at all, other than it reminds me of the one who loved me first. It reminds me of how she sees me as a child worthy and wanted, a child who is capable of learning and growing and loving more, they remind me of why my mom did what she did for us. God was always going to save us. And atonement isn't about satisfying some kind of wrath or will. It's about God doing what God does, which is love us and remind us through being with us in every way, showing us that nothing is stronger than that love, that there is nothing that will separate us from that love. And maybe that's what none of the theories get at. I know I only explained one. There's more, but I figured we didn't want to, you know, talk about each and every one of them this morning. But none of them seem to get at the answer of why. They talk about what and how, but not why. And why tells you about a person. It tells you about the person who's doing it. Jesus is not forced by an angry God to give himself up. Jesus chooses to offer himself in love because he believes so much in the goodness of God, in a loving God. So the question for us then is what then will we choose to do in this love that we have been given? Atonement and salvation, it, it's about what we will do with and in and for this love. And as always with God, we have a choice. We can come to the light and be healed or continue in the dark in isolation and fear. There are many winding paths to God, and I believe that we can get there in a lot of different ways as Wesley did. But God never wanted us to take a path of fear and death and judgment and condemnation. God always wants us to live. Let us now join together in a, a prayer of confession and assurance. For God so loved the world that Jesus came giving his life for all lives, that we may not perish or wither in the fear of condemnation, but that we may live. Forgive us, O oh God, for not understanding, for not seeing the light for what it is a source of revealing and healing for the world meant to guide and deliver us. Forgive us for keeping to the darkness, whether in our ignorance or not, in the ways we have thought and acted towards God, others, and ourselves. Merciful God, help us to see, to believe, and to walk in the ways that lead to life. We'll take a moment for silent prayer. Hear the good news. 
Christ died for us, closing the gap created by sin and rose again that God could free us from the tyranny of judging ourselves and others to live fully in the power of God's grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, God forgives your sins and offers you a transformed life now. Let us live fully in God's grace. Amen.